Hi everyone, it's James here from Pro Tools Expert and you join me in the beautiful location in West London of Alchemy Mastering. Uh, it's a great pleasure to meet you, sir, Matt Carlton. Likewise. Absolute pleasure. Um, so we thought we'd talk a little bit about the black art that is mastering. Fine. Um, and some of the scariness and some of the things that you can bring to a project mm. that maybe the whole idea of mastering in the box and mastering at home can't okay so just but to get us going tell us a little bit about your history how how you got into mastering and were you a musician first or a, a normal a normal engineer <laughs> uh yeah no i mean um you know i started playing drums and guitar um good choice around about <laughs> 12 years old and um yeah with every intention of you know becoming a rock star of course yeah um and around about 16, you know, the age of 16, um, a friend of mine had uh, Music X, which was like a, a MIDI sequencer mm -hmm. that ran on an Atari, I think it 1040 was. 1040 ST. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Um, and um, so we started mucking about, he had like a polyphonic synth, so we started mucking about with that and, uh, you know, so kind of got into programming and then we got some various other instruments, so, yeah, SH-101 and... I got to lease this drum machine and, and that kind of thing. Um, but I think it, it kind of became clear probably around about the age of sort of 18, 19, that I probably wasn't going to make it as a as a rock star. Um, or at least I maybe had to consider uh, uh, other, other options. options. Uh, and so I was, you know, I've obviously always been a, a, a huge music fan and, you know, wanted to be involved in some way. Um, and I ended up getting a job in a radio station as a, a it was like a YTS scheme, just mm -hmm. a youth training yep. scheme, um, the equivalent of an internship today. And I worked there for a couple of years and, you know, had a lot of fun, um, you know, had a show, I used to make commercials, make jingles, um, you know, kind of drive outside broadcasts and, and, and do various interesting things. Um, but I was never really a radio nerd, do you know what I mean? And right, it wasn't... Yeah. Um, you know, I really enjoyed it. It was a great place to work, but it, it kind of almost wasn't close enough to the music for me. You know, I, mm -hmm. I wanted to be a bit more hands on. Um, and through the radio station, I just met a guy who uh, was a mastering engineer, still is a mastering engineer. And, you know, he, he kind of knew what I did and he thought that I might be, you know, good at, at mastering. Um, so he invited me to, to sort of spend the afternoon in his studio, mm -hmm. which was uh, a place called The Exchange in Camden. Which isn't there anymore, but great. great it's it's scary room. the number of times you hear. I worked at this studio. It's not there anymore. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, the exchange had a great run. You know, it must have been there for at least twenty years, but hmm. um, probably longer. Uh, and you know, so I sat in a, a, a room not dissimilar to this, with you know, massive speakers, cutting lathes, tape machines. It, stuff with knobs on it and you know he was playing all this great music um and i just thought this is wonderful you know i've no idea what he's doing but this is the kind of thing that i could really get into mm -hmm. um and so i'd you know i was kind of talking to him i was like right so how do i how do i start you know um and there wasn't the kind of proliferation of college courses back then there was only like one or two kind of courses that you could do for sound engineering and um you know realistically i don't think they were as good then as they are now mm -hmm. and certainly not as kind of recognized or, or renowned um so he you know he was kind of like you just need to start in a studio you know you start at the bottom and work your way up and uh so i was like okay great so how do i get into a studio you know um can you make tea um, well, <laughs> I could make tea, um, which was a start. And uh, but you know, I mean, more than that, obviously, you know, I knew my way around some musical instruments. I knew a bit about programming. Um, you know, knew a bit about sampling. Knew a bit about recording because I used to do a lot of recording in the radio station. You know, knew a bit about EQ and compression because yep. you know I had to use them. Um, and uh, he just sort of said, "Well, you know, uh, you can try writing to various studios." But, you know, it's you're probably not going to have a lot of success, but maybe look in the back of Music Week, see if anyone's advertising for a trainee at any point. And um, it just so happened. And this is one of those times when you think, you know, the universe yep. is, is steering lining, a path. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, lining because up 
no word of a lie, the following week in Music Week, which is a magazine we used to get at the radio station every week, mm-hmm. um, there was an advert for a trainee mastering engineer or a mastering studio wanted a trainee. Um, you know, so I applied for the job and um, it actually took about, I think it actually took like four or five months for it to kind of actually turn into me. The stars to align. There. And, yeah. But um, essentially, you know, I, I applied for the job and I got it. And that was at a place called Porky's Mastering. Um, uh, Porky's Prime Cuts, which was a studio in um, Shaftesbury Avenue, mm-hmm. you know, in the middle of Soho. And so at the age of 21, you know, I moved to London and, um, yeah, started working in this sort of mad rock and roll basement um, studio. And I've been doing it ever since, you know, that was 20 years ago. And, yeah, just kind of, you know, I've worked in a few different places now, um, you know, worked with some really great engineers and, you know, kind of learned a few things along the way. And, um, yeah, here I am. So is, is alchemy your thing or is it like a because uh, there's a, a trio of guys who work here aren't there? yeah yeah so it's uh so the three of us own alchemy um we are the engineers uh, so myself barry grint and phil kinraid you know uh we're equal partners and um we moved to this location in uh brook green in west london um about four and a half years ago, um, we opened this set of studios. Alchemy has existed for nearly 20 years mm-hmm. in various guises. Um, but I came on board. I actually worked for Alchemy, um, a previous incarnation of Alchemy, right. uh, 10 years ago, I think it was. Um, but yeah, it was, it was 2012 when we kind of formed the partnership of the three of us and uh, sort of relaunched from this location. Right. And uh, yeah, you know, started building this studio facility, and um, it's certainly a great spot. I mean, you're yeah, thank you. well connected, but off the beaten track. Would yeah, be. yeah. I mean, it's it's cool. You know, a little kind of Victorian muse, which is kind of nice. Um, obviously, there's a lot of music heritage in West London. Mm. You know, Brook Green, especially. Well, you've um, got all the record companies within staggering distance all the record companies are still here um and there used to be a recording studio at the other end of the muse in fact you know going back like 30 years or so um so yeah you know it's a cool location and um yeah like you say it's a little bit out the way uh but yeah it's you know it's it's nice you know obviously there's you know so much kind of music history in labrick grove shepherd's bush kensal rice you know all around here that it's it's kind of you know it's it's a cool place to sort of you know, be part to of. To make music and to work in the music industry. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Um, so one thing that I'm seeing an awful lot of resurgence in, I know the phrase is the vinyl revival. Mm-hmm. You can't help but walk in here and um, <laughs> and witness the beauty of a Neumann lathe. Yeah. Um, this one dates back to... Yeah, so this is uh, Neumann VMS-80. So this is the last uh, model of lathe that, um, that anyone built. Um, Neumann, in 1979 it was, they launched the, the, the VMS-80. So this baby is 38 years old. Yeah, thank you for doing the maths. Um, and this is one of the first one. I think this is serial number... 24 it's either 24 or 28 we've got another one next door one's 24 and one's 28 right. i think this is 24 um they actually only built somewhere in the region of 82 or so of these models we think right. um so there weren't too many of them they did follow it up in uh 1982 approximately with um the dmm lathe which uh this is a lacquer cutting lathe right so this cuts onto a lacquer disc um, the kind of final uh, uh, sort of development in vinyl cutting, I suppose, was cutting onto a copper disc, right. what's known as DMM, which has some advantages in um, a lower noise floor, but disadvantages in terms of the way the actual record sounds. Right. Um, and I think most cutting engineers would prefer a lacquer cutting lathe because it sounds better. Right. Um, most pressing plants would prefer a copper cutting <laughs> lathe because um, it's actually a lot easier to uh, process and create the records and they have a lower noise floor. Yep. They just don't sound as good. Right. Um, but yeah, so uh, this, um, this model here, uh, Alchemy has owned this um, for, I don't know, probably 
probably 20 years. Yeah, getting on for 20 years. Um, and yeah, it's cut a lot of sides. Um, it served us well. Uh, it's in a constant state of, of kind of modification. Mm -hmm. I think, um, yeah, from talking to various other people who, who cut vinyl, I don't think their lathes are ever finished they're ever no. i think they're always a there's a mod to be done yeah yeah and and you know obviously things change over time as well you know it's it, it not dissimilar to having a classic car mm -hmm. you know um they kind of they need regular maintenance regular servicing and all this kind of thing um and even just you know the performance of capacitors and and, and that kind of thing yeah. will change over time and yeah. you know what neumann supplied as stock it doesn't behave you know 38 years on, it doesn't behave in the same way as it did when they were testing it in the factory, for example. Yeah, because of course, 38 year old components don't sound the same as brand new ones. Exactly. Uh, tolerances were plus and minus 10% if you were lucky yeah. back then. Yeah, yeah. You're now dealing with plus and minus 0.01%. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, there's, you know, obviously there's different. Like you say, there's different stock that exists that you can put in, different combinations that you can try, um, and and all sorts of other things um, that you kind of look at. Uh, you know, we've rebuilt the power supplies. There's internal wiring that's changed. Um, the feedback amp is something that most people get fairly down and dirty with. Yeah. Um, that made the, me sound intelligent then, didn't it? I, did. know, yeah. I know a little bit about yeah. cutting vinyl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I mean, the amps... The amps in general are something that uh, intrigue me, that I'd love to, what I'd love to do, and one day it will happen, is have another lathe that isn't in active service mm -hmm. and enough uh, kind of budget in terms of time and money to see what can be done about the amplifiers. Because the amps are incredible. Mm. They really are. But they're of a kind of industrial spec yeah. amp as opposed to any kind of hi-fi amp um, and it, it would be really interesting to know you know what you could do about that um, but are you know. finding that, that, that this baby's being used more and more now with the more that that you're cutting a lot more vinyl um, what I would say I mean I have always well I, I was cutting records by the time I'd been working in mastering studios for about four years so let's say I've been cutting records for 16 years and I've always cut a lot of vinyl that's kind of been you know from the from the minute that i saw the lathe it, i realized that i wanted to get my hands on it yep. and use it because I, you it, can it, see why yeah, can't you? It's, it's they're a, fascinating yeah. bits of kit that it's really nice you know especially in this age of computers you know things that are kind of manual mechanical processes like this you know are, are really good and um for me i, I mean you know I, I sort of often said to myself, if I wasn't a cutting engineer, you know, I'd love to be like a stonemason or a, you know, a dry stone waller or a hedge layer or something. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Something that's that's kind of hands on mechanical. Yeah, but but craft. Do you know what I mean? And that's that's really what this is. It's 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 a craft. You know, it's it's that kind of skill. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, I knew straight away that I wanted to get into it. I mean. The thing about cutting lathes is um, you kind of have to be sort of slow to start off with them and people aren't that keen to kind of just let anyone loose on them for the simple reason that it's very, very easy to burn out the cutting head mm -hmm. in some way, shape or form to damage the coils or, or to damage the cutting head in some way, which is this bit here. Yeah. And, you know, a rebuild is going to cost you, you know, Two thousand pounds, three, four thousand pounds, um, and that's just the cost of the repair. You know, it might take two or three weeks to yeah. get repaired, and during that period, if you haven't got a spare, you're not cutting any records. Exactly. Um, it's a big hit for any business to take, and you know, uh, small businesses like mastering studios. Um, you know, obviously, you have to be you have to be careful, and you have to know what you're doing. Um, so anyway, so, uh, you know, I, I always wanted to, um, you know, kind of make this a big focus of my sort of engineering. Mm -hmm. So I have always cut a lot of um, vinyl. It's been a big part of, of my career, big big part of my client base. Um, 
But what I will say now is that more and more projects are having a vinyl component, mm. you know, whereas they didn't um, 10 years ago or, or 15 years ago. You know, you see indie bands, rock bands, um, you know, jazz records, classical records, you know, these kind of things. A lot of these records weren't coming out as vinyl releases 10 or 15 years ago. Um, you know, and it's well, the numbers speak for themselves. Vinyl is now, I'm not going to say it's outselling CDs, but I know the numbers are very much in vinyl's favour. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's... it. Uh, the good thing about vinyl is that I think it really kind of tallies really nicely with um, streaming and kind of download listening. You know, both, both those things, um, you know, streaming and downloads... Uh, are a great way to listen to music in many respects mm -hmm. you know it's it's amazing that you can go on to you know spotify or apple or uh, you know pandora, pandora or, or whatever, yeah, yeah deezer or, or whatever you you takes your fancy i'd say other, um, other streaming services are available but yeah i think uh, we've probably listed the main ones <laughs> yeah i think so uh tidal yeah um it's great that you can just go you think i want to listen to this and you can probably listen to it do you yeah. know what i mean that's that's amazing you know um I can't imagine what it must be like growing up with that facility. Not um, not having to think, right, I'll go to the record shop next week. Or, yeah. or if I listen to it on the radio, I've got some yeah. annoying voice hitting the yeah, top. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to record it. But yeah, I mean, that used to be it. You know, I'd, I'd save up my, you know, my pocket money, my paper round money. And, you know, you'd think, well, I want to buy this, 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 this and this, you know, these records. But I can only buy one. So you'd go mm. to the record shop and you'd, you know, you'd pull that one out. You think, OK, is it going to be that one or is it going to be that one? And. You know, then you put that one back and you get that. Do you know what I mean? And you'd spend half an hour just trying to work out which which of the five or six records you wanted hmm. you were going to buy. Do you know what I mean? Um, Here's the question. Yeah. What was your first vinyl you ever bought? Uh, the first record that I ever bought was, um, it was a Eurovision Song Contest entry. Uh, this is where you're supposed to come out and say, yeah, it's David Bowie. Yeah, yeah, something really but, cool. Um, mine's not cool at yeah, all, well, unless yours is the same as mine, and then it's brilliant, because I because mine's also a Eurovision entry. Right, it was, um, I can't, they might have been called Bardo or something right, like that. Right, okay. What was yours? Buck's Fizz, making Bucks your mind Fizz. up. No, it, was, it wasn't <laughs> that. I wish it was. I wish it was. I think I think it was the year after that. So that would have been 85, I want to say? Oh, maybe it was the year before that. I, it, 85 how I was 10 then no yeah it was it must have been more like kind of 83 right. I would have thought I, I could be wrong timing wise so. yeah yeah so could I um and they might not have been called Bardo I can't I can't remember anything about it that was the that was the first so the first I bought single. that on seven inch oh, fantastic. um the next thing that I bought was actually a cassette um so I was I, you know I was really into cassettes we were of the and, cassette um, era weren't we yeah Cause, yeah because I mean I, I was very lucky my parents had a proper Thorin's yeah turntable at yeah, home yeah yeah with a leak amplifier and oh, Warfare nice. speakers. Oh, you know, wow. That was a proper, yeah, yeah. you know, seventies hi-fi. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I've still got the turntable. Have you? Because actually, it's quite a nice, heavy-weighted yeah, yeah. studio turntable. Yeah. It needs a bit of TLC, but yeah. another story. Yeah. Um, but if I can get vinyl of stuff, I I, I love going around charity shops even yeah. now. Oh, go, yeah. And people are selling off. I, I think I picked up Dream of the Blue Turtles by Sting. Right. Yeah. Fifty p. Yeah. Yeah. You, you Fifty p are quid. Yeah. You, you do find realize, some amazing stuff. Yeah. I've, I've probably got sort of three, four hundred now that have. Yeah acoustic treatment in the studio <laughs> yeah they're, they're actually they're pretty good for, for that bass trap bass trap behind the console yeah um but yeah so the, the next thing i bought which i should have just led with this really was uh thompson twins into the album into the gap i think it's called yeah um yeah, which is a killer killer record um you know so i kind of i, I feel that i started getting cooler um you know reasonably quickly uh maybe um so uh but yeah the, like i said the, the kind of streaming and download thing works really well but you know what it doesn't obviously deliver is any of the the tangible um physical nature that uh, you know we as humans we like collecting stuff we like holding stuff we like looking at stuff and the fact that you've got this huge yeah you know um 12 inch square yeah which could have a gatefold in it, which exactly. could, all the, you know, all the loveliness and, that comes and, along with vinyl. Um, you know, what's happened as vinyl sales have gone up in the last five years is people have started spending more money in, in terms of packaging, in terms of presentation, in terms of, in terms of sound quality as well. Um, you know, and, and what I've noticed, you know, and what we've noticed here at Alchemy, um, and, you know, 
without trying to blow our own trumpet, you know, we do get used for a lot of kind of higher quality, you know, kind of uh, sort of higher price, you know, reissues or, or, or new products. Um, is the people that are going the extra mile, the record labels, you know, the artists that are going the extra mile in the vinyl, they're the ones that are selling more numbers because mm. it's a bit of an investment, you know, for the fan, for the listener. And so they want to get their money's worth. Um, and so it, it just works really nicely with the digital. And you know, there is something about the sound of records. Um, it's, you know, there's an, an imperfection there. Not every record sounds great. Um, but a great sounding record, you know, delivers something that no other listening experience does. You can get past the occasional um, crackle and hiss and pop and whatever. Yeah. Because there is, I think you're right, there's absolutely something about listening to a, making the effort to be delicate with it, put it on the turntable, yeah. lift over the, the, the arm and set the stylus down and, and then hearing the groove, hearing the needle hit the groove and that the anticipation before yeah. you hit that first yeah there's there's all of that then i mean you even you know there's there's a few in, in terms of the sound of records you know does vinyl sound inherently better or worse than digital well no of course it doesn't i am not prepared to go there yeah yeah no and in fact you know there, there isn't long enough in the day for that discussion but there are certain things that it has in its favor um you know not least See, one of the things that I think is quite interesting and is a factor is, you know, a, a vinyl record, you know, let's say that it's come from a digital source. Let's ignore kind of any kind of pure analog disc cutting at this point in time, because most records are being created from a digital source. Mm -hmm. And that digital source is being played out through a, a, a D2A, obviously, yep. um, and then onto the lathe and being cut. If it's being done in a cu um, cutting room, you know, mastering studio, that D2A is going to be exceptionally good, okay? We'll talk about that particular one in a minute. Yeah, but, um, um, yeah uh, we'll, we'll come to that. Um, so the, the sort of D2A, and then obviously when the, you know, the, the listener, the consumer, whatever you want to call them, um, the fan is playing it, you know, they're just then playing analog at, straight out through their amplifier to the speakers. If they're listening to a digital file at home, they're listening through their consumer DA. Now, you know, they may well have a great, you know, hi-fi D2A. But, but it ain't going to be that good. It's it's probably not going to be that good. Or, you know, there's still a vast majority of people are streaming stuff off their phone, off yep. their laptops. You know, the D2A is, it's pretty poor. Well, so, at best, rubbish. Uh, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And that's not to criticise laptops or phones or, or anything like that. Um, so you've, you've got, you know, on the one hand, you've got a great conversion. And on the other hand, you've got a really, you know, average. average um, that's being kind, isn't it? Is being kind. Uh, you know, I, I think that's a factor. Um, I think as well, you know, when people are, you know, have a turntable set up, you know, you have to have a turntable, you have to have, um, an amplifier, you have to have a phone, a preamp, you know, it has to come out to speakers. In general, people who are playing records at home have made some kind of investment in the sort of replay facility. I, and right? I think they're making an investment in time as well yeah. because there is that, well, I've got 20 minutes aside. Yeah. So I'm going to put the record, the needle down, yeah. and I'm going to sit down and listen to yeah, whatever and, it is. And enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, there is a, there's a, a really big argument for that that's what's bringing back vinyl yeah. that you have to make the investment in time to listen to a piece of music yeah now be that classical jazz rock pop whatever r and b um let's face it the the dance genres and i'm not going to use the phrase edm because i was shot the last time I, I, I brought that one up the dance genres for them vinyl's never gone away yeah because the djs have always been djing vinyl yeah 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 and in fact you know, the reason that so many pressing plants were still around in order to um, provide the stock for this growth in vinyl has been because of, in general, the dance music genres, like you say. Um, you know, and I think that's something that, you know, independent electronic music labels, independent dance record labels, you know, should be very proud of that basically the... The reason all these cutting lathes are still running, the reason all these pressing plants, you know, presses are still operating is because, you know, 
between 2000 and 2010, when no one else was pressing records. They still were. They were. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's, that's an awesome thing. Um, it really is. So, so well done to them. Well done to them. Right. So let's, let's, let's go the other direction. Let's get away from, from the, 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 the discussion of art to yes. the discussion of tech. Okay. Because um, we've just been chatting with a, a fellow colleague mm. and you were talking about a particular piece of kit and you said, oh, yeah, but I want the mastering version. Right, okay. And the mastering version adds four figures. Yeah, yeah. Now, what is it? I mean, we'll talk, we'll talk about a little bit about your chain without giving too many secrets away in a minute, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, but what is it about a piece of kit that puts itself in the mastering bracket versus the, should we call it the studio mixing bracket? Yeah, um, I mean, I guess it, it's probably two different things. I mean, first off, you know, in general with mastering, you know, we're dealing with, you know, a stereo mix down, you know, let's leave aside anyone Stems who's mixing in like, mono yeah, yeah. and let's leave aside um, kind of multi-channel stuff, although the, the principle is still pretty much the same, which is you can do a lot of damage by sticking something over the, the stereo, stereo mix, mix bus, yeah. right? Um, so whatever you put across that, um, you know, especially, you know, we're talking about analog now obviously um or hardware let's say not necessarily analog but but certainly hardware so do you find you use any plugins at all or are you all out of the box uh no 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 um i think there are some things that you know plugins do exceptionally well um limiting is is uh you know it's a really important part of kind of contemporary music sounds you know a, a lot of styles of music you know a lot of artists a lot of a and r guys you know want things to be pretty hot um you know which means that you're going to have to use some limiting and you know plugins are very very good obviously they can they can you know have insanely quick attack and release times and and you know all sorts of other kind of you know clever things going on i mean you know when i'm kind of starting a project like my default template on the record side you know has i think it's eight different limiters you mm -hmm. know just all preloaded all with a, a kind of standard you know sort of plus 4 db kind of gain thing yep. going on which just means that i can just you know solo between all of them because they all sound different yep absolutely. um i mean we have some hardware limiting options as well um you know but you know things like that and that you know that's another advantage with plugins is that it's a cost effective way of having quite a few different yeah. different tools so you know absolutely i do use some you know at eq as well i mean um you know mostly most of what i'm doing is eq compression and limiting stereo image mm -hmm. um you know I, I occasionally get into kind of other things that may be a bit more clever than that but you know that's uh, you know more of a rarity 99 mm. times out of 100 um you know, and are you are you in a are, are you in a uh, i always eq first then compress then limit or no you, uh... no i mean one of the, one of the things that i think is really important is to not always do anything right do you know what i mean i like that, I like that you know approach. if 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 you think to yourself oh yeah i always do that don't do it next time do you know what i mean or at least try not doing it mm -hmm. Because it's you know we uh, we're very it's very easy to fall into a pattern and a groove. Um, I mean, it's important to know what works, but it's also important to know that you know there's many different ways to skin a cat. So, I mean, if I'm starting a project, my kind of default starting point. Well, no, let's be honest. The first thing I do is listen to you know the material I've been yep. provided with, and you know in doing that, I will probably have some idea of how I want to approach. The session whether i want to do you know um a, a bit of analog on it whether i want to keep it all digits whether i want to you know just do it um in the box uh you know what i'm going to need to do kind of dynamically and and you know sort of tonally cue wise um, i suspect most of the time you're getting stuff from engineers and, and mixers who know their shizzle yeah um, they, they know what they know what they're trying to achieve yeah and they're basically giving it to you to to polish yeah that the, the phrase i've seen i've seen before is is the the pre-tweaked photograph right where it's it's it look the original looked good yeah the mix made it a bit more shiny and, and the the mastering was the polish on top that yeah yeah i mean i i guess 
you know, I, I kind of, you know, if you want to like have a visual analogy, mastering engineers love a good <laughs> analogy. Um, and, and one that I like um, is, you know, I, I think, you know, mastering engineers, all right, let's, let's forget about the, the kind of technical side in terms of creating a master that's, mm -hmm. you know, yep. a lacquer disc or a DDP for a CD or, or whatever. You know, the actual kind of creative bit of mastering is, you know, to me, it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, a picture framer framing a picture. Yep. Um, you know, when, you know, Matisse or Monet or whatever, you know, when they'd finished a picture, you know, they'd take it to the picture framers and the picture frame would, you know, look at the picture and then, you know, find a frame that he thought, you know, resonated and showed off the picture yep. in its best light, you know. And if it's, um, you know, you wouldn't put some kind of, you know, antique brass looking thing with, you know, cherubs and trills all over it, you know, over a Paul Clay, you know, yeah. modernist piece because it, it wouldn't, work. you know, I mean, or maybe it would, maybe the, you know, it, it would work by looking wrong, but, you know, mostly it wouldn't. So it, it's kind of, you know, for me, it, it's kind of a bit like that analogy, you know, we can't change the notes, um, you know, we can't retune the singer, but we can hopefully try and present this recording in its best light in a way that's going to make it kind of most understandable for most of the listeners and make it resonate with them in the best possible way you mm -hmm. know um so in you know in general terms you know if you're making like a, a sort of banging drum and bass record it's going to be probably pretty bright it's going to be you know pretty loud and up front you're probably not going to worry too much about the kind of front to back perspective. It's mm -hmm. more about, you know, it kind it, of sitting on the end of your face. A good solid bottom face. end and being yeah, yeah. in your face. Be, yeah. Exactly. You know, if you're doing, um, you know, a, a kind of a sort of jazz trio or something like that, you know, you'd probably tonally do something quite Absolutely. opposite. Yeah. yeah. You know, and if you swap those two things around and, you know, had the drum and bass record, you know, super dynamic, super quiet, you know, not very bright, big front, front to back perspective, it probably wouldn't resonate with its target audience in the way that the artist would want it to. Do you yeah, know what I mean? So yeah. it's, it's kind of about, you know, uh, sort of finalizing the tonality, the, the, the dynamics um, in a way that best suits the piece, that best suits the, the target audience yep. and, and and everything else um all of which is quite a long way from the question that you asked me which was um the difference between kind of mastering versions and non-mastering versions of, of analog kit and i guess um you know sometimes there might be an upgrade of components um just in terms of because it's sitting on the mix bus you know there might be an attempt to um uh, I don't know, have a, a slightly cleaner signal path within the unit itself. Um, maybe the, you know, the, the bypass is going to be kind of hardwired and, and, and that kind of thing. I, mean, I, think, I think often it comes down to the fact that generally, or often, should we say, um, a mastering unit is a stereo thing yeah. and a studio thing might, might be a four channel or an eight channel. So yeah. therefore there's going to be a certain um, compromise in components to keep the price down. Yeah. Whereas a mastering thing generally you guys are either able to or kind of madly prepared to. I think madly prepared to, um, <laughs> more than anything else. Spend but, a bit more cash Yeah, I mean, you know, look, we don't have to buy mics. Do you know what I mean? We don't have to buy guitar strings. We don't have to buy drum kits. Um, yeah. Know, or certainly yeah. not, or well. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, uh, we don't need as many tools. I mean, but we do buy insanely crazy expensive stuff um but yeah you know i think often you find you know with with mastering gear you know, might find an upgrade of power supply or an external power supply you know instead of something that's in the unit itself and the the sort of the kind of recallability and and, and matching is is also very important so you want to know if you've got an eq you want to know that if i dial in 300 on the left hand channel and 300 hertz on the right hand channel i want to know a that they're both at 300 and B that, do you know what I mean? The they're, number they're, of clicks on the left yeah, is the same. Yeah, it, exactly. Um, so that it's exactly the same. And that needs, you know, every function of the unit has to have that degree of, of, of matching, you know, to a, a tolerance of, of kind of 0.1% or whatever, which, 
you wouldn't worry about in a necessarily in a you know something that's just going to be used in a recording or a mix um, application because we're just tone shaping maybe one instrument at a time exactly yeah yeah you know you've, if you're putting a bass guitar through you know one channel of an EQ then fine you know you you, you turn the thing and it's like you know it, it says 300 if it's actually 400 or 250 it doesn't really matter as long as it sounds, sounds right good. Yeah. Um, you know because it's uh, it's less important for, for for kind of different reasons so yeah you know we kind of um, we have to accept that and um, and deal with it and and it's cool so so how will you receive a master from the studio will it come as a as a, a download or a, a yeah uh, um i mean i guess you know uh, there's so much I mean, stuff I, see, I see tape yeah. so do you you still yeah. get quarter inch and half inch tapes yeah. yeah 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 not very often um if it's a new project you know but it, it does happen um you know people are still mixing to tape um but obviously, uh, you know, a lot of the time when that happens now, people are kind of, you know, having the tape machine as a, a in effect and kind of looping through yeah. it and then capturing back in digital. It's simply because, you know, tape's expensive and, um, uh, you know, it's it's a bit of a faff. Um, but, yeah, we're always delighted to receive tape. You know, we've got three um, three machines. We've got the Ampex ATR 100, we've got A80, and we've got a... Um, a820 as well. So, but um, and presumably the the legacy back catalog from all the recording um, the record companies that are around here are sending you yes back catalog. Hence, yeah. hence we talked about the oven ups, the industrial oven. Indeed, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I nearly made this, this the error of saying, "What on earth did you do that?" No, I know, I know. I am not going to ask that question. Yeah, I was that far from asking it. Yeah, yeah. but um, but presumably most of your work comes via. Yeah, via the internet. Via it, the web. it does. Yeah, um, you know, most of the stuff that comes in is digital, and you know, obviously the lion's share of that is um, files, mostly delivered over the internet. Um, I think personally, I'd always prefer to have it have, not having gone over the internet. You know, I'd rather have a drive, or you know, um, if someone. You know, if it's, it's, you know, often people will be bringing stuff in and it just exists on their laptop. And, you know, mm. we can just take a thumb drive, you know, from the laptop um, and put it straight onto our service. And are you going to be asking for 96K? No, I mean, I don't. Or? Uh, I, I, I try not to create too many rules for people um, for a number of reasons. But, I mean, if someone's mixing... A record you know i would always say to them work at the sample rate you know if you if there's an audio component there which you know usually there is yeah. you know you've recorded some stuff if you've recorded it at 44 probably best just to mix it at 44 keep everything at the sample yeah. rate that it is right mm -hmm. um render it out at 44 um you know because unnecessary conversions up and down sampling even when it's done really well it's not going to improve it's not help, things. Yeah. Um, so, whereas, whereas, would would you recommend, from your experience, people record at the highest sample rate possible? It depends. Um, <laughs> I mean, right. So, forty-eight k has always, and you know, up until this point, been quite a good kind of spec to work to when you're recording and mixing because. Um, you know what people can find if they've got a big project running at 96k is it, they it can start to crap out and all of a sudden you can't use all the plugins you want to use on every channel and that kind of yep. thing which you could do at 48k yeah um so uh, you know there's that decision to make and it's not really for me to say which one is going to end up being the best you know if you work at 48k and can use all the processes that you want to use is that better or worse than if you work at 96k and end up having to freeze a load of tracks you know render stuff out make decisions blah yeah. blah, blah. I, I couldn't tell you which one is better it's it would depend on the project but you know there's a certain argument to say keep your options open mm -hmm. um then there's does 96k inherently sound better than 44 um Probably not in every instance, you know. Probably not on every record. Probably not once For, it's once it's gone down to MP3 and is listened to via earbuds. Uh, well, uh, that's a whole other thing. I mean, if 
you know, if, if someone put a gun to my head and said, what sample rate should we all work at? You know, let's just standardize this right now and everything's going to be delivered. Everything's going to be recorded, mixed, mastered, and the consumer is going to receive it at the sample rate that you say, I would say, let's go for 96. Um, in fact, I might even say let's go for 88.2 because yep, it gives us nice backwards compatibility yes. to, to kind of CD standard. But it's, you know, it's kind of horses for courses. Um, I mean, when I'm mastering, you know, if I'm going out into analog, then obviously I'm recapturing. Um, I would usually do my captures at the sample rate of the master that i'm delivering right so you know on a standard digital release even though i've gone out into analog i would probably most of the time capture at 44 if the client then wants a high you know a higher res delivery for, you know for whatever reason for archiving or because they there's a you know they want to do some kind of high res release yeah. um you know i'd rather do that as a separate you know additional capture Obviously, there's a cost implication there. It's not always possible, you know, and, and, and you kind of have to be flexible. But, um, you know, I'm a big fan of trying to avoid sample rate converting where I can. Mm -hmm. um, I've never heard it make anything sound better. No. Uh, so uh, the, the, the principle, and as you just said, if you've recorded at 44.1, mast, mix, master, do everything at 44.1, if you're eventually going to master in the analog domain your a to d either end is your sample rate conversion yes because you've exactly. gone out into the analog, yeah, analog exactly. world yeah exactly. so i mean say so personally i always try and record 96 yeah because hey it's my studio and what i say goes so yeah yeah, yeah um yeah i'm not generally sharing with many people and if i want to send us off to mastering i will phone the mastering engineer and say uh I'm at 96, is that a problem? And yeah. they go, no, fabulous. Yeah. Or, no, can you can you go analogue out to whatever? Right. Yeah. But 99% of the time, you guys have got better gear. and Yeah, I wouldn't have thought that any mastering engineer should have a problem with that. Mm. Um, so so let's talk about a little bit about that, their software behind you. Mm -hmm. um, you're running Sequoia. I am. And, and you, like I, are on the dark side. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> running a PC. Yep. Yeah, I, I'm I'm new to this game, so please yeah. bear with me. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's all right. Yeah. I, 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 once I, you come to terms with it, I'm right. I'm, I'm joking, of course. Once I'm in Pro Tools or once you're in your your DAW of choice, it makes a very little difference. Yeah. Um, there's a few rules to learn, as I'm discovering. Yeah. Um, and you can break those from time to time. Yeah. But but Sequoia, why Sequoia? Or just just because? Yeah. Um, so it was uh, in 2008. Um, myself and another engineer. Uh, Ray Staff um, started setting up a mastering room in Air Studios um, up in Belsize Park mm -hmm. and you know we'd both used Sadie for many many years um, which is another uh, Windows based sort of piece of mastering software um, but you know we were both interested in seeing what else was around because certainly I'd come up against Clients felt that, you know, perhaps the software that they were using in a recording and mix environment, you know, whether it's Logic, whether it's Tools, um, you know, Cubase, going back a ways, you know, there seemed to be more flexibility around things like, um, you know, having kind of multiple streams, um, automation, you know, these kinds of things. Mm. Um, and so we, we kind of wanted something that, that, you know, had all the kind of mastering functionality. So uh, PQ encoding and, you know, the ability to write DDPs and read DDPs and all this kind of stuff. Um, something that's very good at, at editing. Um, For those of you out there who don't know, DDPs are basically what you send off to a production plant for a yeah, CD. Yeah, to, to make a CD. Yeah, it's a CD master format. Um, but also something that, you know, if you wanted to have, you know, 36 channels of audio all playing simultaneously with you know plugins all over the shop and you know mix automation whether that's gain or plugin automation or anything like that you know something that, that could, could kind of do all of that um, you know and so so we looked around at you know tried a few different things and Sequoia was really one that um, you know just just kind of sort of struck us as being really good um, because it did all of that and also 
at the time, which I think it was unique, um, it had uh, object-based effects. So um, any particular recording, um, if you wanted to put any kind of effect or, or automation or anything specific just to that bit of recording, you could actually drop it onto the object. Because up until this point, you know, if you're assembling a 12 track album, so you've got your, um, you've got your edit decision list, your, yep. you know, your project open and you've got track one, two, three, four, blah, 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 all in a row. If you wanted, you know, automation or, or whatever, um, you know, you'd, you'd be drawing that in time. So, mm -hmm. you know, yep. I'm going to automate this track to be a bit louder than automate a fade yep. on this one or, or whatever. Um, and if you wanted, you know, to drop in VST effects, you'd have them on a channel strip, yeah. right? Um, you know, all of which is fine and dandy until the client says, yeah, we love the album. We just track three is now going to be track six, track eight is track one. Do you know what I mean? And this would happen yeah. all the time. And then all of a sudden, uh, all this automation and all, all this kind of sort of things that are keyed to time goes out the window and you have to rebuild all of that, make sure you get it right. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, what Sequoia offered, because everything was just with the object and each object was a track, you pick it up and you move it and everything just moves with it. So it was it was like this is, you know, this level of flexibility saves us time, means we make fewer mistakes or mm -hmm. potential mistakes. Um, you know, and and so it was just a, a kind of really strong package. Um, and it's Sequoia software only or is it hardware and software? Yeah, or? no, it's, it's software only. Um, you know, which is another thing that, uh, you know, is kind of cool. So, you, you know, you can build, you know, the machine to the spec that you want. You're not tied into anything. Um, and, yeah, um, it runs on a PC, hence us running PCs. I mean, you know, as I said to you earlier, if it ran on a Mac, I'd run on a Mac. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Because, um, you know, I like the software. Uh, if at some point in time you know, something else comes out that I think is better and I want to use that piece of software, I would, you know, jump to that. And if that, you know, meant you know, emigrating to Mac, I'd do that. You know, I don't really mind, you know. I'm... It's not the platform, it's, it's the process. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so you're recording in, and it looks like you're recording in via probably the um, some of the finest A to Ds I've uh, Certainly um, the DADs, the AX32. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and you've got an army of them down there. <laughs> we have, yeah. But in fact, they're only DAs. So, um, you know, early on when we moved to this facility and we were building it, um, you know, uh, we were looking at what converters to use. Um, you know, I've used most of them, mm -hmm. to be honest. And, uh, you know, at the kind of price point that uh, mastering spec, DAs and ADs are they're all really good right yeah you know they, they aren't none of them are bad but you know they do all have a different sound and so it's a case of finding ones that kind of sound you know the way that you want things to sound over a, a reasonable variety of material you know we deal with although I'm mostly dealing with contemporary music you know I am dealing with um, you know everything from you know pop rock techno uh, jungle you know whatever you know we're kind of right across the board on contemporary music and then we do a lot of um you know uh, kind of reissues you know so we're doing stuff from you know the 50s onwards as well mm. um you know the converters kind of have to perform well across a variety of different sort of program material and they do sound beautiful and 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 they sound great um you know We'd had in uh, uh, the sort of previous uh, incarnation of Alchemy, we had, do you ever see the white two channel dad converters? Um, I haven't I seen them in real life, but I've seen we've still got We've still got two of them here. I can't remember what they're called now. But they sound great. You know, they, they really sound great. So I knew, I knew dad were really good. And, and, you know, I tried a whole, I, I tried everything, um, you know, uh, alongside also knowing, you know, I've had crane songs for years, which are great, you know, had prisms for years, which are great, you know, had apogees, you know, um, and the, the, the sort of gold dads, the DAs, I just thought sounded incredible, but they weren't too, they weren't too much of one thing, you know, um, I mean, I've tried some converters and you think that's great, but it is bright, mm. you know, or another converter, you think that's great, but it's actually, it's a bit thick. 
and that's going to work on some things, but it's not going to work right across the board. And, mm. and that's really what the, the DA stage of the dad did for me. The AD didn't quite do it for me. I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastic. It, it is, but, um, it didn't, it didn't quite give me what I wanted. So, um, that's why, so the DAs, I mean, you've seen them there, down mm. the, yeah. the, the front of the desk on well, the other well side. Hidden. Um, so I've got a couple of different A to D options, which um, both of which sound quite different and and give me a couple of different flavors. You know, you've got the bow, which is, um, you know, very transformery sounding, you know, um, thick sort of yeah, thick, vintage. -y yeah, exactly. Kind of, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, and you've got the lavery. You know, I mean, this the bell's really good for you know, kind of techno in the box kind of records, mm -hmm. um, where you know it, we, we're kind of liberally sprinkling on flavor and, and character. Yeah. The lavery, you know, is is kind of cleaner, you know, really punchy, direct. Um, it actually has a few different sounds, I would say, within itself. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, very good on pop, very good on rock. Um, I mean, I found if you're, you know, if you're capturing something, you know, kind of sort of minus 12 or something like that um it's very very clean sounding you know if you drive it right up to the end stops you know you can get something that's a bit more um you know a bit more grungy a bit more pushed you know has a bit more kind of character a bit more mm -hmm. um, sort of balls to it and then of course it's also got the the soft saturation which sounds remarkably like the ampex atr 100 yeah you know, so you've they might as well call it a tape button, almost. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it really does. It really does sound close to printing to half inch. The, the more people I talk to about these, the Lavery Gold, the more times I think, yeah. And I, I and even even with mates, rates, and friendly <laughs> friendly favour pulling, I, I'm like, I just can't. Yeah, I mean, look, I it's, just can't. It's it's a big investment. It is a big investment. But they sound. Uh, but it's anyone great. who knows their onions. Yeah is using stuff to that level yeah exactly exactly um you know so you know I'm a, I'm a huge fan and you know it's really it's really important for us because again it's about you know if i've just got the stereo mix there's there's no place to hide you know anything that i do has to be like forget the decisions that i make you know anything i put on that has to be of the highest quality mm. otherwise it's going to degrade the signal in a way that isn't doing my client any favors so you know we have to make that level of investment and you know so you're coming out of sequoia through the the dad's yep into you're, analog into analog via mm -hmm. either the lavery or the bell no so those no, are the sorry. ATDs. so no, there's the ATDs. sorry yeah. no, you're coming out out yeah and so what what then hits your chain i can see some dangerous stuff i can see some stuff which looks scarily mastering with huge knobs <laughs> and very few markings on them <laughs> what is it with you mastering engineers and no markings on stuff yeah it's all part of the black magic <laughs> um yeah so um eq wise you know it's i mean it's quite a minimal setup here and that's uh in in terms of the hardware that i've got and that's because um it's because it's very expensive uh, and <laughs> reassuringly expensive. reassuringly expensive and and one of the principles that we have here at alchemy is we try not to borrow any money so when we want to buy something we wait until we've earned the money and then we buy it and um as frustrating as that is because it means it takes a little longer mm -hmm. um it when, you, when does, you've got it it's yours not the bank when you've got it it's yours and um actually it's much less pressure do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, the, the pressure of having huge debts uh, isn't necessarily a nice thing and it isn't necessarily offset by, you know, having a pool tech as well as a sun tech, which I will do um, <laughs> in, in the next couple of years. Um, You've got to so, find one first, though, presumably. Uh, I, I, think, um, I think the new ones look pretty good. Have you seen the Pulse Technologies? Yes, yeah. I have. Okay. Yeah, and they, they're now doing a 500 series one as well, which... Okay, uh, we, we're now going to start talking about power supplies and transformers yeah. and all that scariness. Yeah, yeah. But in my world, oh, yeah. I listened Amazing. to it and went, hello? Yeah, yeah. I could have a pair of real pull Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they're still Expensive. a fair chunk of cash. Yeah, yeah. But when you get to that level, um, it, it's, it's funny. Mastering is the next step. I remember starting off as a kid. Yeah. 
and thinking that a hundred pounds on a microphone was a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. And then thinking, okay, well, well uh, and I'll get everything up to that sort of say, should we call it a hundred pound level? And then you realise fairly quickly that actually a hundred quid on a mic or on a pre or on anything is not very much. Yeah. So you move to the six, seven hundred pounds worth yeah. of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then you realise, well, these sound okay, but I'd like some more flavours. And you yeah. think, well, I might as well go up the level. Yeah. So you end up between that one and two thousand quid yeah. point. Which, let's face it, there's a lot of great gear out there yeah, for yeah. that sort of money. Yeah. I mean, there's a, at that sort of price, there's very little stuff that falls into the category of bad. Yeah, yeah. But you then start looking at the next level, the DADs, the um, the merging converters, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. the Happy and the Horus. And, and, and now Avid have bought the rights to the DADs and it's going to be called the Matrix and it's right. silver, not gold. And now That's a really good decision. Yeah, but you, yeah, very good decision by them. Um, don't build your own hardware, which everyone for the last X number of years has been saying, mm, yeah, I could have that, but I could have that. Yeah, you know, yeah. Get license it, get someone else to build it for you, yeah, yeah. and use their tech yeah. and their components. Yeah. Um, but there is that point at which, you, which even, even me, as the ultimate gear junkie, says, no. No, I cannot justify X thousand pounds on a, a vintage piece of kit, yeah. which is probably going to cost me a thousand pound a year to keep going. Yeah, yeah. And then you find there are companies like uh, Paul Tech have come back. There's a company that are now doing Fairchild reissues, whose name I completely yeah, forgot. Yeah, there, well, there's a, a, a cup. A, a, yeah, well, I don't know who you're thinking of. There's, I mean, there's a couple of kind of good Fairchilds. Yeah, out um, there. I want to say Pom Fairchild, something like yeah, that springs, yeah, to, yeah. springs to mind. Yeah, yeah, no, I've seen those. And I just think, Wow, a, yeah. fa a fair child that tomorrow morning when I switch it on to do a, a mix or put on my bass guitar or vocal is going to work. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to that panic. And sound the same as it did the day before. Yeah. Um, which I guess is a, a, a lot of, I mean, what you have to deal with with this level of kit. I mean, I suspect yeah. a, a, it's either new or it's newer technology. Well, it's, Any it's, valves in there? I, I haven't got any valves in here at the minute. I mean... I'm not. I'm not fast about the whole valve versus solid state thing. Um, you know, there's great valve gear, there's great solid state gear, um, and there's bad examples of both as well. Yeah. So if if something's great and it's valve, then I'll use it and I'm happy. The advantage that the solid state has is that generally it stays the same. Whereas yeah. valve is always changing. You know, and it, it just is and it and does. And yesterday will be different to tomorrow. And yeah, and, you know, after a couple of years, um, you know, you're going to need to change the valves and it will change again. Do you know what I mean? Um, so at the minute, I haven't got any, any valve gear. I mean, you know, believe me, there is, you know, the two sort of next things on the shopping list are valve EQ and um, valve limiting, you know, so, so that will be happening. Um, but like I say, it's a case of, you know, um, kind of working up to that. It, it's mostly new stuff that we have in this room. Um, but the EQ, that said, is, you know, probably 40 years old. Mm -hmm. um, Sontec, dual path, uh, mastering EQ for doing um, uh, it's dual path. So it's four channel, essentially. Right. So if you're cutting from tape to vinyl, then you can have the preview look ahead signal as well as the the, the printed printed signal, exactly yeah. um you know and that uh, you know again I've, I've had you know i've had mazalek eqs i've had the massive passive had the gml had the avalon um the api 5500 which is an eq that I, I i love and is fantastic um you know had the curve bender um you know, That's we've got the, the, the TG, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the TG one two three four five or, or or whatever it's called. Yeah. Um, you know, the the Guy Raff valve EQ, uh, which we've got in another room here. You know, these are all great EQs, but the Sontec is, you know, if I only had one EQ, which is for the you, rest of time, it would be great. that because it's rare that you put it on something and think, hmm, that's not working. You know, it sounds spectacular it does most things um and it you know even just you know running something through it without having any eq in mm. um it tends to just give a little bit of body and just a, a little bit of 
you know, just a little bit of, of weight, but in a nice way to the signal. Um, so, you know, that's, that's my main um, EQ. Compression wise, we've got a couple of different options in here. Um, I noticed the, dan the dangerous. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so the first VCA compressor I got for here, you know, was the Mazalek, um, which is a, a multi-channel um, mm -hmm. VCA compressor, which is you know three band and and it is excellent. And you know, I didn't really want to get another VCA. Um, you know, it would be nice to to get. Um, you know, uh, a sort of very mu in here. It'd be nice to get, um, you know, like a FET um, in here as well. But then... Well, you just put 20 grand down. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Believe me, I know. Um, but the Dangerous came out and, and you know, I, I, I don't know Chris Muth uh, personally, but obviously I know him by reputation and I know people that do know him and, you know, can't speak, you know, too highly of his... You know, can't speak highly enough of, of his kind of technical expertise. So I thought, well, I, you know, I've got to check the dangerous compressor. Um, you know, because I wanted a, a something that would be like a mix bus compressor. Yeah. You know? And so you think, well, really, I want an SSL, but uh, it, uh, an SSL does. It's doesn't, a one trick pony. It's a one trick pony. Um, is there anything out there that? you know, can do that, but does other things. Mm. And, you know, so, um, you know, Ollie got me uh, the dangerous compressor and, you know, it's just one of those where you sort of plug it in and you put something through it and you just... Oh. You smile. And I'm just like, well, that, this isn't leaving, you know. Well, I, I can't afford to buy this right now, but I'm going to buy it right now because it's not leaving this room ever. Yeah. You know, and, and that was one of those, you know, it's like, oh, damn, why did I demo this? It's, it's funny because <laughs> both um, you and Sean Janocchi yeah. both swear by that thing. I yeah. mean, he's a Lavery Gold user as well. And we've yeah. done a, a, a couple of videos with him about gain structure and stuff. So. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and the, the thing, one of the things the Lavery does brilliantly is allow you to get in and fine tweak to the to the nth degree. Yeah. Um, and the, the Dangerous has all those sort of features as well. The fact you can get in and just get super accurate. With yeah. It. And, you know, and they're not that much dough. It's, 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 it's a great price, mm. you know. Um, and it can do, I mean, I mostly use it as a mix bus compressor in that way. So it's probably going to be the first thing in the signal chain mm -hmm. and I'm probably not going to slam it. Um, you know, it's probably more going to be a tickle of 1.4 to 1 or 2 to 1 or something like that. You know, but you can, you can do the SSL thing, you know, you can go 3 to 1, you can replicate the attack and release times and, you know, it doesn't sound exactly like an SSL, but it, it does that thing, you know, or you can... You know, you can go up to six to one, or you can use it as a limiter. Um, the auto, um, it it just has quite a few kind of really clever different things. So, you know, the auto attack and release actually works really nicely as a kind of averaging mm -hmm. compressor, which can be really nice in a mastering environment. You know, or you, obviously you've got a lot of control with the attack and release. Um, the knee. Uh, is really nicely integrated, you know, it's kind of soft, hard knee, um, you know, the, the different effects you can get with that. And also it has this, um, I mean, I was speaking to, uh, so I was speaking to Ollie, the distributor, about a year ago about this. And, and he was saying, you know, I know that, uh, you know, just tell me that how you're using it. And I was kind of going through and it's got this like smart compression mm -hmm. button, which I guess, um, I don't really know what it does. I think, uh, you know, maybe it introduces kind of uh, a, a different way of, of working out the attack times or maybe brings in a second attack time or, or, or something like that. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. But essentially, um, you know, with this kind of smart function engaged, you, you, it gives you a really nice kind of presence lift. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I've, I've not used one enough. But. Yeah, it's it's awesome. But I mean, I remember saying to him on the phone, I was like, well, smart, well, you always have that in. And you, what I said to you earlier about always, it, it came out of my mouth. And as soon as I got off the phone to him, I was like, well, why do I always have it in? I mean, I know it sounds great. And so you start taking it out and it's like, oh my God, it's a whole other compressor. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's It now does a completely different thing. Um, so it, it covers a lot of bases, you know, and um, yeah, it's just, it's a great it's a great compressor to have in a mastering room. Um, and of course, so I mean, there's a few other goodies. I mean, you've got the the TC. Um, yeah. So um, 
Yeah, the the M6000, which um, you know has been they around for the... a long time, but it's got some great stuff in it. Um, you know, it's got some really good compressors, good limiters. This one's got um, it's got the GML emulation EQ. It's got mass and well, yeah. I don't know if it's an emulation or if it's just Massenburg's digital EQ. It's it's got, very very good. It's incredible. I mean, it doesn't sound like a GML hardware so no. i don't know if it's supposed to or not but i mean it doesn't matter it it sounds it's probably my favorite or certainly one of my two favorite digital eqs that i've ever heard um so you know that that obviously it covers a lot of bases um you know we've got some hand-built analog uh stereo width processing mm -hmm. um and it, you know some various bits to do with kind of vinyl cutting um, but let's not forget the um, the two rather large elephants in the room, the ATCs. <laughs> yeah. Now, on first sort of reaction, I went, there's no way they're going to sound right in this room. They're huge. Uh, yeah, they are. They are. Um, but I've also witnessed ATCs in, uh, in other rooms and gone, oh, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I, I love ATCs. Um, and throughout... So, uh, Probably every, I would guess every like three to four years, I seem to have dust by in my career flip-flopped between using monitors and hi-fi speakers. Do you mm. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, you know, I've gone from the big PMCs to BMWs, BMWs yeah. you know, then gone to, um, uh, you know, sort of Pioneer Tads to ATCs. You know, I've had Genelex. Uh, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I've, I've had quite a few different things. Um, and I mean, I think I can't imagine kind of going back from, from the ATCs now. And what it was, I'd used ATCs, uh, the SEM 200s, uh, probably about 15 years ago. And, um, I liked them, but they weren't, they weren't sort of brilliantly integrated into the room that they were in. Um, that could have been done better, but I did a, I did a presentation, I did a talk at um, a university in a massive lecture hall about, say, you know, eight years ago, something like that, eight, nine years ago. And it was, I mean, it was an 80-seater, 80-seater, uh, 80 not 80 mm. <laughs> 80-seater um, kind of lecture hall with, you know, huge banked um, seats. It was probably, it, was a, it had to be 60 foot. Mm -hmm. you know front to back it could have been more i can't remember and the same in height i mean the height was insane it was like a, a massive room and um atc ben Lilly from atc had come down and he brought a pair of scm 150s and so you know we had them up on stage and we were playing stuff through and it sounded incredible especially i mean at the back of the hall the bottom end was it was you know it in almost, the producer's sofa <laughs> it almost brought a tear to your eye and you know I, I did my lecture and my talk or whatever you want to call it you know a couple of hours and at the end of it you know sort of like right so has anyone got any questions and ben who was sat at the back put his hand up and he said i don't have a question but can you play that track again because it sounded you know glorious um and so, you know, in light of that, it's like, you know, when I build my next room, you know, I want to get ATCs in there. And, um, you know, so we, we put this this pair of SEM 150s in this room, which on face value, they'd look a bit too big for the room. But what it gives me, because one, one of the things, in general, I'm not a fan of active speakers, right? right? Because what I want to do on every replay system that I come across is I want to over amp it. You know, I want to put something that's at least twice as big amplifier wise as yeah. it needs to yep. be. Um, just to give me that transient response, that headroom um, and, and the power. Not not because I want to listen any louder, but just... Yeah, you want, um, the, you want the headroom. Yeah, yeah. you want, you want the, the sort of reservoir available. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, in general, any loudspeaker manufacturer that's making active speakers is making them to a price point, and they're not going to massively overamp them mm. because it's not cost effective. So that's always kind of counted against active speakers in my mind. But obviously, one of the things about having a pair of speakers this big in a room this size is essentially they are yeah, over -amped. They're amped for the size I, of the room. I don't need to crank them. So yeah. we have that that reservoir to draw on. We have that amount of headroom in the amplifier system. 
and they just work, you know. Um, Acoustics-wise in this room, we, you know, we did it ourselves and, um, you know, there was a lot of trial and error involved with that um, and a lot of working with, uh, not just with ATC, um, uh, you know, Ben was very helpful in the early stages of, of putting this room together, uh, but also with a, an acoustician who, you know, we'd bring in every month or so to, you know, do some mm -hmm. evaluation yep. and see where we were going with it. Uh, a guy called Nick Whitaker, and, and he knows these speakers very well. So the room kind of came together around the speakers, and and you know it really works. I mean, it does, it does sound really good. It you can always tell when I'm doing these sort of things in a mastering room because the mics sound really nice. Yeah, you yeah. don't get the kind of room tone or anything like yeah. that. Um, you know, because of the size of the room, acoustically it has to be quite tight. You know. Um, because we need a lot of absorption from the walls, from the ceiling, you know, so that we haven't got those reflections coming back. You know, if the room was twice the size, you 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 know might go for a more kind of open sound. Um, but you know, it works, and it's you know we've done a lot of work um, acoustically. Like I say, there's been a lot of work on the power supply side, a lot of work in terms of cabling and all this kind of stuff to to get the room to sound. You know, what I wanted was some something that sounds really good. Um, isn't fatiguing you know because i'm in here 12 hours a day five mm -hmm. days a week uh but also something that isn't too flattering and i i think i think we've achieved that you know if something sounds bad the atcs aren't gonna you know um shine a, a, a you know polish the you know what yeah, yeah exactly you know they they do you know shine a spotlight on how things sound um and you know, I, I, they're a great company to deal with. And uh, yeah, I, I can't imagine anytime soon wanting to listen to anything else. Matt, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for taking time out of your day You're to welcome. have a chat. Thanks for coming down. Um, it's been an absolute joy to wander around and just ogle at gear. I've been James from Project Expert and we will see you again soon for some more gear talk.